Hey, welcome to the mysterious and creepy. Today we're going to be covering two real-life vampires. Enjoy, and be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Alright, let's get into it. Werewolves, witches, and other mythical beasts have long been some of society's favorite fictional creatures. But there's one fiend of the night that has always stood out above them all. The vampire. Vampires have always been the most romanticized monsters of the bunch. From Dracula to Edward Cullen, we have always been obsessed with their existence, albeit fake. But what if there were real-life vampires out there that weren't so fictional? That's exactly what happened in Sacramento, California in the 1970s. Horribly mutilated corpses, signs of cannibalism, and bodies drained of blood had police scrambling to catch a madman. Surprisingly enough, Drinking his victim's blood would not even be the most disturbing part of the case. Six victims met with a horrible and untimely fate before the killer was caught. Richard Chase would go on to be known as one of the most disturbed serial killers in history. But what made Richard Chase into the monster he became? What could drive a man to commit such atrocities as he did? Was there something that could have been done to save Chase and his victims? Stick around and dive into the shocking story of the Vampire of Sacramento to find out. Richard Chase lived a less-than-ideal childhood. He showed early signs of severe mental illness, including living in delusional states. Sadly, his father, who was strict and physically abusive towards young Richard, refused to get him help. Chase was known to set fires, wet the bed frequently, even in adolescence. He was also cruel towards animals. Many people may recognize these habits as the McDonald Triad, a series of youth behaviors believed to help predict the likelihood of someone growing up to be a serial killer. In this case, science would prove correct. After his father supposedly kicked Richard out of the house, Chase turned to alcohol and drugs which only exacerbated his condition. Chase became convinced multiple times that his heart had stopped, and he was, in fact, a walking corpse. He believed he was lacking in vitamin C and would reportedly smash oranges against his forehead, believing that his skin would absorb the nutrients directly into his brain. Also believing that his skull had split apart under the skin and pieces of bone were moving around on their own, like a puzzle. In order to monitor the movements, Richard shaved his head. Now, at the age of 25, Richard was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In 1975, he was institutionalized. The psychiatric hospital staff and patients would go on to nickname him Dracula, due to his absurd fascination with blood. He had been witnessed killing small birds and attempting to drink their blood on several occasions. He claimed he did this to counteract a poison that was slowly turning his blood to powder. He even attempted to inject himself directly with rabbit's blood, which resulted in him becoming violently ill. Eventually, Chase was released to live with his mother. Not long after his release, Chase moved out of his mother's house as he believed she was poisoning him. He moved into an apartment with some friends. The roommate arrangement was short-lived, however, as Chase's paranoid behavior and drug use eventually led to his friends moving out. On his own once again, Chase went back to capturing and killing small animals. He would reportedly eat them raw or blend their organs with soda and drink the mixture. In 1977, Nevada police found him late one night in the Lake Tahoe area, covered in blood. In the back of his pickup truck, they discovered a bucket containing a liver. Authorities determined the blood and organ belonged to a cow. Yet again, Richard Chase had slipped through the cracks of a system that could have helped him and protected others. An unfortunate mistake that happens all too often. Richard continued to spiral downward and sink into his delusions. A confrontation with his mother is believed to be a major factor in his shift in victimology from animals to human beings. She simply hadn't allowed him to come home for Christmas 
and he was upset. Just one of the various reasons his life now took a very dark turn. Ambrose Griffin, a 51-year-old man, became his first victim. While driving by their street, Chase pulled out a 22 caliber pistol and shot him in the chest. On January 23, 1978, Chase broke into the home of a pregnant Teresa Wallen through her unlocked front door. He felt, he would tell police during interrogation, that an unlocked door was a kind of invitation to him, a very popular vampiric trait of needing to be invited in to enter a home. From that time on, all his victims were people who had left their doors unlocked. Richard Chase shot Teresa Wallen three times using the same gun he used to shoot Griffin. Chase proceeded to stab her with a butcher knife before cutting out her organs and drinking her blood. He reportedly used a yogurt container as a cup. Was this the first time he properly fulfilled his vampire appetite? Four days later, Chase found Evelyn Miroth's door unlocked. Inside were her six-year-old son, Jason, her 22-month-old nephew, David Ferreira, and a friend named Dan Meredith. Meredith was found in the hallway of the home, a gunshot wound to the head. Evelyn and her son were found in her bedroom. The young boy had been shot twice in the head. Evelyn's stomach was cut open and multiple organs were missing. One of her eyes had been attempted to be removed unsuccessfully, and her corpse had been violated. The baby, David Ferreira, whom Evelyn Miroth had been babysitting, was nowhere to be found. The baby's body was found behind a church months later. During his trial, Chase would reveal that a knock on the front door caused him to flee the scene. He stole Meredith's car and took the baby with him. The visitor would alert the cops, who identified Chase's fingerprints in some of the blood found at the scene. When police searched Chase's apartment, they found that all his utensils were stained with blood and his refrigerator contained human brains. Richard Chase's trial lasted for five months. The defense tried to avoid the death penalty by pleading insanity. However, the jury did not take long to side with the prosecution. Chase was found guilty on six counts of murder and sentenced to death via gas chamber in 1979. While incarcerated, awaiting his fate, fellow inmates often encouraged Chase to kill himself. And so he did, stockpiling his anti-anxiety medication until he had enough for a fatal overdose. He was found dead in his jail cell the day after Christmas in 1980. In a more recent case, Roy Gutfinski partook in a bloodletting ritual with his then-girlfriend Deanne Jones in 1999. He and Jones who was 16 at the time, assaulted another young girl by using a razor to cut a seven-inch gash across the victim's back and drank her blood. Gutfinski was charged with elevated aggravated assault, aggravated assault, and reckless conduct for the girl's attack, which required 32 stitches. He was convicted in March 2000 and later sentenced to 10 years in prison with all but three years suspended, as well as four years of probation. Gutfinski, who now goes by the name Caius Veovis, told police he was a vampire who drank blood, his own as well as other persons. His notable forehead implants resemble horns, as if he were attempting to physically appear like the monster he saw himself as. And he boasts many tattoos, one of which reads 666. He has been linked to satanic worship as well. He was most recently convicted of the murder of three men in 2011. Although no evidence of blood drinking was found in this case, their murders were nonetheless brutal as they came into contact with a real-life demon of the night. Real-life vampirism has all the brutality without the edge of fantasy from the movies. What do you think of people who try to live as real-life vampires? Do you think Richard or Roy could have been helped? Hopefully we didn't scare you too much with this one. Don't forget to ring the bell so you never miss a video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.